We pray that right now as we open your word, that you would open our hearts, our minds, our ears, help us to see, hear, and understand exactly what you'd want to share with us today. Be with us now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, uh, hopefully you have opened up to Genesis chapter 37. We've been working our way through the book of Genesis on Sunday morning, and uh, we've gone through the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Last week we went through Judah, and now we're going to turn our attention to Joseph. Now, if you've been coming to Calvary for any length of time, you'll know that typically what we do is we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. This is going to be a little bit different over the course of the next few weeks. We're going to hop, skip, and jump as we cover the life of Joseph. And then I'm going to allow you to go ahead and, and read the parts that, that we skip, but it's important to do it this way just to get the feel for, or, or just the, the picture of what's going on. Now, we're going to go through the, the story of Joseph in three weeks, then we're going to come back. And we're going to take one week, and we're going to see that not only is this a story, it's a picture. And it's a picture of something much greater. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go. So this is such a great story. And, and if I could just share on a personal note, it's this story and what we're going to talk about today in the next two weeks, that when Cheryl and I first heard this many years ago, and I'm going to share it hopefully as, as, in the way that it was shared with us, that it, it changed our entire lives. When Cheryl and I first were taught this, we first saw this, it became the filter for how we would make decisions and how we would live our lives. And I can't tell you how many times we've come back to this. So it was all the way back we first got married and we sensed that God was calling us to launch out and start a church and, and uh, to move to this tiny little town of Jupiter and there was no people. There was a few people, but for, by and large, very few people, no funding or anything like this, but it was this filter that caused us to say, yes, we, we, we know that we need to go. It was this filter that we're going to talk about today that when we were a very small congregation, we knew that we needed a place to meet, and so we launched to build the buildings that are just over to my left, your right, that, that we were in for, for several years with, with very little funding at that time. It was this filter that we're going to talk about today that caused us when we saw the need to do something else to, to take the step and, and build this facility. It's this filter that caused us uh, as, as um, we first began the church and we were sensing that God was calling us to have children, that this was the filter that, that God used in our life to tell us to go forward and have those kids. If your filter on having children is, can we afford it, you will never have children. Can I get a witness? Yeah, amen, amen. And, and, and so it, it, was, it was this filter in our lives. And I remember the, the day that a man came to our church way back when, the church was very small. Do you guys mind me telling you this story, by the way? So, so uh, this man stands before our congregation and he talked about abandoned baby girls in China. And I remember driving home that day, Cheryl was in one car and I, and I was in the other. And at that time we had uh, five children and, and um, one on the way, that sort of thing. And we're driving home and the Lord spoke to me and said, you have a baby girl in China. And Cheryl's driving home and, and she senses the Lord say, you have a baby girl in China, go get her. And so I, I remember going home and telling her that day that, that this is what the Lord, you know, I, I just sensed that. She said, I sense the same thing. Well, we didn't have the resources or the ability to, to do that. And we had several kids at home already, but, but it was this filter that caused us to take that step. Uh, and following what we sensed the Lord was leading. Now, if the Lord's not leading you in something, uh, you need another filter. But if, when the Lord calls you to do something, this is the filter that God calls us to use. So this was our, our, our filter that we've gone to. And I can't tell you how many times, as I said a minute ago, we've sat down and we said, I'm sensing we're supposed to do this, but there's no way that it looks like it's going to work out. But I just can't shake that we're supposed to do this. And so this was the filter. The filter comes down to one question, and I put it there on your outline. And it's simply this, what would I do in my situation if I was absolutely convinced that God was with me? 
What would I do if I was absolutely convinced that God was with me? Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so if if Jesus meant what he said and said what he meant, then the only question we have to ask, especially as we're sensing something, is, is simply what would somebody in my circumstance do if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them? Now, that's important because today we're in all different types of situations. Some of us are going through a very difficult marriage situation. Some of us are going through a very difficult financial situation. Some of us are single and there's nobody on the horizon and this isn't really what we planned. And it comes down to one question, what would somebody in my situation do if that person was absolutely convinced that God was with them? This question will always lead us back to just the place that God wants us to be. So today, we're going to begin the story of Joseph. His story is gonna begin when he's 17 years old and everything falls apart for the next 13 years of his life. So as we get into this today, the story begins with Joseph's circumstances being so unthinkably horrible that even as I go through them, there's no way that we could appreciate how bad they are. You have to really think through how awful they are as we go through this. And we'll see that today. We're going to see next week a man who has so much wealth and so much power, it's going to be beyond any of our ability to even fathom. But then the third week, we're going to see the same man who has all the ability in the world to pay back every person who's ever harmed him. And what we're going to see in all three weeks is that he's a man who always does in his situation what anybody would do in his situation if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. You see, it's in this we're going to see that only when I respond in my current situation, whether good or bad or rich or poor or whatever it is, that as someone who is absolutely convinced that God is with them, that I will begin to see God in my circumstances. We, we have to respond first to the circumstance, then we see God in the circumstance. And we'll see that today. Our problem many times as we go through life and our circumstances is that our circumstances somehow, if we don't do this, they will distort our vision, our ability to see clearly. They'll distort our understanding of God. They'll distort our our responding to the situations. And many times, if we're not careful, if we don't respond this way, we'll find ourselves missing God and all that he wants to do. And this is going to be a great story for us because no matter who you are, we're all going to come to a place where we're going to find ourselves in a situation that we can't fix it. There's nothing that we can do to fix it. That's when we learn that our responsibility isn't to fix it. Our responsibility is to respond in the situation as anybody would if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them. We're gonna pick it up in chapter 37. I'm gonna hop, skip, and jump as we go. And uh, Joseph is the son of Jacob. And you wanna keep in mind as we go, there's no Bible, there's no theology, and there's no preachers. There's gonna be something that he gets kind of intuitively. So the story begins. We're gonna pick it up in verse two. It says, now these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, kind of young, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with Bilhah, or the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph, Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, you'll remember from the story that his dad has a bunch of wives, a little bit of a dysfunctional family. The brothers aren't taking care of the flock the way that the father would, would want them to. Joseph would rather be pleasing to his father than to his brother, so he brings back an accurate but bad report, and so they're going to see him as a tattletale. Verse three, 
Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him, most of your Bibles will say something like a, a very colored a very colored tunic. J- just so you know, uh, that's how it was translated from the King James into the English. If you look at the actual Hebrew, it means something more like a long robe or a long sleeved robe. The idea is that if you wore that in those days, it would be a sign of royalty. If you're wearing a long sleeve robe, you're not out in the field doing manual labor. Does that make sense? So j- just know that. So, so, but very colored is, is, is fine too. It's just uh, more accurate to say long sleeve. So verse four, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. So they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So this story is set up for conflict. First of all, you have a father playing favorites and uh, giving him a robe that he's not giving to the rest of the kids. God is going to be giving him some dreams. We'll talk about that. And and it's no secret that that Joseph is the favored son. So there's this tension in the family. Verse six, he said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us, or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Now, he, he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have, I've had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, 11 brothers, were bowing down to me. And he related it to his brothers, and to, uh, to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow down ourselves, uh, bow ourselves down before you on the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So Joseph has these dreams. Now it's important to know that Joseph is going to take these dreams as the unshakable promise of God to him. Uh, You and I have the unshakable promises of God to us that come from his word. They didn't have the Bible at that point. So here he has the unshakable promise that God is giving to him, which is going to be the filter for everything that he does. The brothers go out and they shepherd the flock. Verse 12, then his brothers went out to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, are, are, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said, I'll go. Verse 14, and he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. You want to just notice the brothers are out shepherding. Joseph is the favorite son, so he's going to be home. And so the father says, now I want you to go check it out and uh, bring back word to me. Verse 18, skip down to 18. When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say, a wild beast has devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. Let's see what's gonna become of his dreams. They say, let's kill him. Have I mentioned that this is somewhat of a dysfunctional family? If the brothers wanna kill you, that, that's some dysfunction. So just keep that in mind. So Joseph arrives, and we go down to verse 23. Verse 23. And so it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic. They hate that, that he has that, the very colored or long sleeve that was on him. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it, and they sat down to eat a meal. So they take his robe. They literally jump him when he gets there. They throw him into a pit. The pit is apparently supposed to hold water. It's so deep, he can't get out. Then they sit down and they just begin to have their lunch. So you and I look on and we can just hear Joseph there saying, guys, guys, that was funny. The joke's over. Get me out of here. To which the brothers are probably looking at each other saying, do you hear anything? I don't hear anything. 
You hear anything? I don't hear nothing. Well, verse 25, it goes on. They sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, now from last week, you want to keep in mind, this is going to be a picture of something. We'll talk about this in a few weeks. Judah, from the Hebrew, we say Judah, but the same word in the Greek in the New Testament, the same name is not Judah, it's Judas, Judas. And so that's going to be very important for the picture. So Judah, Judas said to the brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by. So they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they brought Joseph down to Egypt. So don't, don't kill him. Let's capitalize on this and we're going to sell him. So they sell him. Off he goes to Egypt. So here's the question. Would God allow something like this to happen to somebody that he loves? I mean, after all, when you think about it, this isn't Joseph's fault. I mean, it wasn't his fault that he was his dad's favorite. He, it wasn't his fault that God was giving him dreams. And so this happens, and it's, you know, he wasn't, wasn't perfect, but he's not a bad guy. But so far in our story, he's been stripped of all he owns. He's been thrown into a pit. He's been left to die. After a streak of mercy, they grab him, and instead of killing him, they sell him as a slave. And as the story continues, you have a son of a rich man with servants now being sold as a slave. You can imagine that on the way to Egypt, he's thinking, how did this happen? Why is this happening to me? And if you don't know the end of the story, you can begin to say, well, God, where are you in this? Where are you in, the, in this man's life? Where are you in this story? The reason I say that is right now, possibly you're in a situation, you didn't do it. It's not your fault. But right now you're having to deal with the situation and you might be asking, why is this happening to me? We're going to see in our story that God is not asleep. He's right there in the midst of this story. So we're going to see how that works out as we go. Everybody skip over to chapter 39. Skip over chapter 38 to chapter 39. Now, I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. It says, now Joseph, when he had been taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who, were taken, who had taken him down there. And then I want you to underline, the Lord was with Joseph. So he became, success, he became a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So Joseph is taken to Egypt. Potiphar just happens to show up, purchases him. And then there's this phrase that just doesn't seem to fit in the story. And it says, the Lord was with Joseph. Did you underline that? The Lord was with Joseph. To which we would say, with him? I mean, I thought if God was with him, then he'd be at home on the couch and the brothers would be sold as slaves. Isn't that how you think it, it, it would go? I thought that if God were in charge, that these things wouldn't happen to good people. You'd think that if God were with Joseph, then when the brothers tried to sell him, at least if I were writing this story, they would try to sell Joseph and God would just, zzz, just zap him. That's how I'd write it. Anybody else write it that way? That's how I'd do it. So a few years go by between verses two and three. We don't know how many years, maybe two years, three years. We don't really know, but some time goes by. And it says, now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and I've underlined that, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar doesn't know anything about Joseph's God, but he looks on and recognizes something is very different about this person. 
first floor. Joseph, so Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he owned, he was put in charge. You know, it's interesting when we learn to respond in our circumstance like anyone would respond if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them, you're gonna find that people begin to notice. So what was Joseph doing? Well, he's just responding in his circumstance like anybody would respond if they were absolutely convinced that God is with him. And so it's, it's in this that we learn that in those difficult times, my assignment is not to figure it out. My assignment is just simply to respond like anyone would respond in this situation if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. Verse five, it came about from the time that he made him overseer in the house and over all that he owned. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. He left everything he owned in Joseph's charge with him there, and he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. So he blesses the Egyptian because of Joseph. If I were Joseph, I would be saying, how about blessing me because of me? But here we find he's blessing the Egyptian. Then it gets worse. The bottom again falls out of his life as he finds himself in a no-win situation. We pick it up in verse six. I'm gonna pick the last line of verse six. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these things that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and said, lie with me. Just wanna highlight as we've been traveling through, we've looked at the ancient Hebrew pickup lines. Apparently the ancient Egyptians are just about as bad. So she says, lie with me. So this is a no-win situation because if he says yes, there's gonna come a time when she's gonna get tired of him. If he says no, she's gonna become angry with him. So what does he do? Again, this isn't Joseph's fault, but I want you to notice how he responds. Verse eight, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in his house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Which is interesting, you're his wife. I could never sin against God like this. I couldn't sin against God who, by the way, has not done a whole lot for me lately. That's how I would be saying it. <laughs> so, so why would Jacob be declaring his commitment to God? He's far from home. He probably feels abandoned by God in his circumstance. I, I think, I think, for Joseph, Joseph, uh, he remembers something that sometimes we forget. It's not his ability, it's not his responsibility to fix it. His responsibility is just simply to respond in his situation like anyone would respond in his situation if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them. That's the responsibility. It's hard to be faithful to God when you feel like God is not being faithful to you. It's hard to be nice when it's not working. It's hard, again, to be faithful when it doesn't feel like anything's happening. But I have a choice. I want you to write this down. When it's not working out, when it doesn't feel like God is with me, when it doesn't feel like anything's happening, and here's the choice, when my back is against the wall, I will either make decisions based upon my interpretation of my circumstances or upon God's promises. Here's the promise there in your outline. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
So we may, bo- we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, Joseph is like you, is like me, that all he has to go on are some promises that God made, but nothing looks like it's working out. The promise that God made to him would be that they would all be bowing down to him. God's gonna prosper him. Um, And that was given through a dream. For you and I, we have the same unshakable promises, uh, not specifically the ones that he had, but our promises come from God's word. In our circumstances, we have to decide we're either going to make decisions based upon our interpretation of our circumstances or God's promises. So Joseph just does what anyone in that circumstance would do if he's absolutely convinced that God is with him. So what does he do? The plot thickens, verse 10. He runs and it says, and she spoke to Joseph day after day and he did not listen to her to lie with her, be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he, Potiphar, has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us, to make sport of us. He came in to lie with me and I screamed. And when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. She accuses him of trying to to rape her. Potiphar shows up. Verse 16. So she left. She left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in in to me to, to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. Every commentator agrees that Potiphar doesn't completely buy his wife's story, because if he bought the wife's story, he would have just had him killed. So he thinks, well, he might not completely be guilty of this. But here, he's now in jail, prison, for the very thing that he had the self-control not to do. At this point, if it were me, maybe if it were us, we'd be thinking, why pray? Why bother? I mean, not only does it seem like God's not with me, but it seems like God's against me. And then verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph, underline that, and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Now, my Bible says chief jailer. How many of your Bibles use the word warden? Yeah, I I like that word better. So there's that phrase. The Lord was with Joseph, to which... Maybe if it was me, I'd say something like, Lord, don't be with me. Go be with someone else. Since you've been with me, I've been ripped from my family. I've been thrown into a pit. I've been sold as a slave. You've blessed everyone but me. I've been accused of rape, and now I'm in jail. I need a break. Go be with someone else. Here's a good idea. Go be with my brothers just like you've been with me. Anybody else say that's what I'd probably do? Absolutely. So Joseph was probably thinking, Lord, Lord, I don't want to be with you in prison. I'd rather be without you at home. I don't want to do this. And then, then I love this line in verse 21. It says, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the jailer. I like the word warden more. It's like, oh, that, that's my blessing. I get to have a good relationship with the warden. I don't want to know a warden. How is this a blessing? Well, 
we would look on and, and we would think, if, if God was really with me, then none of this should be happening. How could God allow this? So, what did Joseph do while he was in prison? Well, we find that he just did what anybody in his situation would do if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. Verse 22, the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, was he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. I like it says, whatever he did. And Joseph's like, this isn't what I wanted to did. It's not what I wanted. By this time, we may have bailed out on God. Uh, and, and, and we would get that. And again, the warden notices, as Joseph just does what anybody in that situation would do, that they were absolutely convinced that God is with him. Well, the story goes on. And in the next chapter, what we find is that you have two people come to prison with him. One will be the cupbearer to the king, Pharaoh. He's going to represent the wine and the blood in our story in a couple of weeks. And then we have also the, the baker, and he's going to represent the body and the bread in our story in a couple of weeks. We'll get there when we get there. They show up in prison, and they have a dream. And in verse eight, it says, they said to him, chapter 40, verse eight, then they said to him, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the cupbearer tells his dream and uh, as he tells the dream, God gives Joseph the interpretation and the interpretation is in three days, you're going to be set free. You're gonna, you're gonna go free and everything's gonna be great. Joseph is not happy about being there in the prison, so I want you to notice verse 14. He says, only keep me in mind when it goes well with you and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and even there I've done nothing that they should have put me into this dungeon. So he says, just just mention me, just, it's a very small thing, just mention me, we'll see how that goes. Then the baker, who by the way, in our story, in a couple of weeks, is going to represent the body, the bread, he says, it's not gonna go well for you, you're gonna be hung on a tree, and uh, so that takes place. Three days later, it all happens. And then in verse 23, when the cupbearer, the wine steward leaves, verse 23, it says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And once again, the bottom falls out of Joseph's life. But the Lord was with Joseph. There comes a time in every believer's life, we find ourselves in a situation and we ask, how do I get through this? Well, the answer is very simple. It's difficult, but it's simple. All I have to do, and you wanna write this down, is simply take the next step, the next step that anyone would take if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them. And every day I have the choice, we have the choice. Do I define God by my circumstances? Joseph's circumstances, he can say, God doesn't love me. I've been sold by my brothers, I've been accused of rape, I've been thrown into the prison. The cup bearer forgets me? Or am I going to define God by who he says he is? That he will do what he's promised to do. And it's my decision every single day how I respond. I want you to notice a couple of verses here. Notice what Jesus says. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. We say, but Lord, do you see what's going on around me? Yes, but I know who's with you. Then it says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. But I feel so alone in this situation. Yes, Jesus says, but, but I'm here, I'm here. Here's a promise. 
Peace I leave you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The world's peace is always based upon our circumstances. God's peace is always based upon his presence with us in our circumstances. It's very different. So here's the challenge this week. In your marriage that's difficult, maybe in your singleness and there's nothing on the horizon, maybe in that financial decision, whatever that, whatever that situation that you're facing, that financial crisis or whatever it might be, simply do one thing this week. Simply look at your situation and say, what would somebody in my situation do if they were just like me, facing the same situation with the same aptitudes, abilities, talents, resources, or maybe with the same lack of aptitudes, abilities, resources? What would that person do in this situation if they were absolutely convinced that God was with them? Joseph's story begins when he's 17 years of age, which is very young, by the way. And for more than 10 years, nothing good happens. That's for us. That's for us for more than 10 years because many times what happens is we say, I've been praying for three days and nothing. So here's a man, and this is going to be an extreme situation. Your situation will probably not be that extreme. But what we find is that God was there in the situation all the time doing something beyond what anybody could see currently going on. That same God who was behind the scenes in Joseph's life promises this to you and I. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. But I like how David says it even better. David says it like this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Do you know why he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Because sometimes we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, when you become a believer, it doesn't mean that everything just begins to work out perfectly. You and I live in a fallen world. That's why God calls us to live in whatever circumstance we're facing like someone who is absolutely convinced that God is with them. Now, now this will do two things, and we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. When you face your situations and you say, what would somebody in my situation do if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them? one of the things it's going to do is it's going to help you accomplish things you would never do before because you believe God is with you. Sometimes you face a situation and you say, what would somebody in my situation do if they were absolutely convinced that God is with me? Sometimes the answer will help you to endure some very difficult times. So whether it's to accomplish or to endure, we're called to live our lives as somebody who's absolutely convinced that God is with us. Does that make sense? And so as we pray today, here's what I wanna do. And I I wanna say, here's the challenge. I don't like the word challenge, I just don't have a better word. For one week, one week, let's go and live our lives facing our situations and saying, well, what would somebody in my circumstance, my situation, facing the same thing that I'm facing, what would that person do if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them? And do that. And see what God does and see how he shows up in your situation. Could we do that? Yes. Well, let's co- close in prayer and, and let's do that this week. And we'll pick it up here next week. Let's pray. Father, I know that there are so many of us here and we're facing so many different situations. I've said marriage, singleness, finances, but Lord, you know all the situations that we're facing. And Lord, we we realize that some of us, maybe it's because of decisions that we made. For some of us, we didn't make the decision. It just showed up. 
And whatever it is, Lord, from this point on, as we go forward, we purpose as we face these situations to ask the question, what would somebody in my situation do if they were absolutely convinced that God is with them? And Lord, we're gonna do that. We pray that you give us great wisdom as we go forward. Lead us, guide us, open closed doors according to your purpose. But we wanna go forward as though we're absolutely convinced that God is with us. And guys, when you do that, that's when you see God begin to show up in your life. Father, thank you for this congregation, their love for you, their love for your word, their love for your spirit, and their love for the things of God. I pray, God, that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.